Hello and welcome to Urban U. I'm Ari Goldberg. And I'm Abby Ashola. And today, we're getting out of the city a little bit, bringing you our show from the gorgeous green campus of the College of Staten Island. This month from the CUNY Graduate Center, we're sharing a story about a transgender opera singer who had to retrain his voice after transitioning, and a cartoonist from Kingsboro who illustrates with both hands at the same time, and plenty more. But first, one of the things CSI is known for is its disability studies program, and that's no accident. In fact, that's why we're here on Staten Island today. This month's For the Record is more somber than a lot of our past segments. But from a darker history here, it's come much brighter today here at the College of Staten Island. This is the College of Staten Island, where it has been situated since 1993. In terms of sheer size, it is the largest campus of all the CUNY schools. It also serves the largest number of students with disabilities of all the CUNY schools, over 300, 70 with autism, and emphasizes programs for disability studies. And this is no coincidence, as CSI has made it a point to never forget the troubling saga of the former tenant of these grounds. You see, this 204-acre campus is built on the site of what was once the largest state-run institution for people with intellectual disabilities in the nation, the infamous Willowbrook State School. Willowbrook was founded in 1947 in the buildings of a general hospital that had closed after the end of World War II. At the time, services for disabled people in America largely still followed the institutional model that had begun in the 1800s. While in theory, the idea was well-intentioned, educating and providing for the special accommodations of those that needed it, as the years wore on, problems arose. Overpopulation became a major issue. Some institutions were housing five times as many individuals as designed for, and paying for two world wars and a Great Depression dried up a lot of the public funding for intellectual disability services. Now, this is not to say there weren't dedicated staff in places doing what they could with limited resources, but for many institutionalized individuals around the country, this was segregation from society, not help, and the situation was nothing short of a nightmare. At Willowbrook, from the 1950s to the 1970s, human experimentation was conducted on children, infecting them with hepatitis to study the disease. This was not particularly public knowledge. Also, it was only intended to hold 4,000 individuals, but it was crowded with 6,000 by 1965. It was that year that Senator Robert Kennedy visited the facility. And I think that particularly at Willowbrook that we have a situation that borders on a snake pit. It took until the early 70s for things to begin to change. A newspaper reporter for the Staten Island Advance, Jane Curtin, was the first to publish the horrid conditions at Willowbrook in 1971. And shortly after, a young Geraldo Rivera broke the story to a national TV audience after sneaking into the facility. The footage speaks for itself. A successful class action lawsuit by families in 1972 would mark the beginning of the end for Willowbrook and of the institutional model as a whole. As the state worked to find alternatives to institutionalization, it would take until 1987 for the last residents of Willowbrook to be relocated. But along the way, landmark legislation was passed out of the lessons learned from Willowbrook, such as the Education for All Handicapped Children Act in 1975 and the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act of 1980. Today, many of the former Willowbrook facilities are part of the College of Staten Island, and in partnership with other advocates, they've created the Willowbrook Mile, a walking trail through campus for reflection and education on the story of the Willowbrook State School, a legacy to honor the gravity of this important piece of New York and American history. For the record, I'm Ari Goldberg. While we've been here today visiting the Willowbrook Mile, our own Maria Vami had the chance to interview several CSI representatives about the work the college does as advocates for people with disabilities. One of them is Diane Buglioli, who's dedicated her life to this cause. She began her career at age 19 as a nurse at the Willowbrook State School, and she remembers her first day there very clearly. I was given a key, which I happen to have with me, because I never gave it back. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty substantial key, it's a steel key. 
and um, I was uh, sent to a building to um, start my first day. And I went up to the first door and I opened this steel door with this key. And uh, it was the heaviest door I had ever experienced in my life. It was really a heavy, heavy steel door. And I get to another steel door, opened another steel door. And I thought to myself, it was such a surreal moment for me. Why in God's name are these kids locked behind steel doors? That vision has never left me in the 50 years. Diane and other caretakers would often spend holidays with some of the children whose families had chosen to not have contact with them. I think a lot of us stayed there because we were their connection to the outside. That's, uh, his name is Joshua. And uh, I watched Joshua actually take his first steps. At the time, he was six or seven. If it wasn't due to any issue in terms of his physical well-being, it had to do that there was nobody there to work with him on a, on a continual basis. More than, you know, more than 85% of the people that worked here really worked here to try and make a difference and, and got tremendous uh, self-satisfaction for being the one to teach somebody to walk, teach someone to speak. When TV reporter Geraldo Rivera finally blew open the doors of Willowbrook, Diane and her co-workers, who tried so hard to help the children, thought his expose ignored their desperate work but she soon changed her mind. Five years later, 10 years later, you know, I realized that if he hadn't done what he had done, that it showed people that, you know, some of it appeared tolerable, the changes wouldn't have happened as soon as they did. And I apologized to him like 20 years later. <laughs> the two met again at the ceremony of the Willowbrook Mile, which Diane is involved with. When it was selected that it would be the college, those of us from Willowbrook were really, really pleased about it because everything that Willowbrook was, it was segregated, it was secluded, it was regressive, would, would do a 180 degree turn. The property would become collaborative. The property would become progressive. The College of Staten Island has been an anchor in the community to honor the legacy of Willowbrook State School families in many ways. I think uh, you know any institution that's dealing with an uncomfortable past needs to go back and look at the legacy of their institution, acknowledge the uh, troublesome, if there are troublesome uh, pieces in that past, uh, you know, talk about how that fits into the place and how that fits in to the mission and how that might guide future conversations. Many of the programs at CSI have unique focuses on disabilities, whether it's within neuroscience studies, physical therapy studies, or at School of Social Work. We don't only look at people and the disability that they have, but we look at society and how, how it treats and how it works and how it's structured and the ways that that often creates barriers towards people belonging. The college holds lecture series thanks to the Gerardo Rivera Fund with a goal to continue the legacy of empowering people with disabilities and influencing public policy. One of the things that we've done is um, advocacy for direct care workers who have not had um, pay raises that are equitable. And so there's a lot of turnover we see in direct care workers. And families often talk about feeling um, unstable as a family in regards to that. And so we were able to come together and head to Albany and really advocate for the specific issue that was impacting a lot of families on Staten Island. CSI is also one of four CUNY colleges to participate in the Melissa Riggio Higher Education Program, which prepares young adults with intellectual disabilities to be competitively employed and to obtain higher earnings. My sister graduated with a bachelor's in international relations, and my brother just recently graduated with a bachelor of science, and I knew right away I wanted to be just like them. Being able to first start traveling to campus on their own, like every other college student, it embeds them with some type of confidence that gives them the opportunity to try out other goals that they didn't think were possible. I learned not to give up and to be confident, and even with a disability, I can set my mind to do anything. My favorite class was self-advocacy and media, liter li media literacy. The program's mission is also to provide all college students with a more integrated environment and come in contact with a population they might not otherwise. 
it really gives them a different outlook on life that this person is also in the same room as me, completing the same tasks as me, that maybe they are capable of working in the future, or maybe they are capable of being a part of my friendship circle. And the mentors who work side by side with the students are fellow students themselves. So the mentors are there to kind of post and pre and post teach all of the coursework material and break it down in a way based on the student's learning profile. So we may have artists, uh, social work, media literacy, whatever have you. Uh, we recruit them from very different backgrounds so that our students can kind of have an organic experience and pairing up with peers. I originally was going to become a lawyer, but once I kind of really got in line with our students and I got to know them and they got to know me, I realized that I think I wanted to go into teaching. So they changed my personal path in such a uh, beautiful way. I wanted to go into public speaking and I achieved that by this year for my senior project, which I'm planning to expand, is being a safe zone ally trainer for the LGBTQ community rights with disabilities. They march across stage uh, just like our graduating students and there's not a year that they're not cheered and applauded by the audience for their efforts and participation in the program. I would like to work in a daycare with children who have special needs. My goal is to make video games more accessible. Have a video game, like controller type thing. Ah, oh, graduation, it was, it was the most memorable experience of my life. It's something that 22 years ago would thought would never happen, so Look at this journey. You did it, kid. For Urban U, I'm Mari Evami. And now we go to an exclusive performance for Urban U by spoken word artist Cameron Bruno. Double wide easel and a penetrating stare, a local artist captures the essence of his subject in a flash. Magali Laguerre Wilkinson went to Kingsborough Community College for a lesson in art from Kenley Dillard. Yes, Kenley Dillard is fast. Not this fast, but fast enough to burn right through a pencil while keeping a hearty supply of paper close at hand. He was hard at work when we met at Kingsboro Community College. Kenley's been drawing since he was three years old. I always felt like I was good at it, so I made that my main focus. It was the only way I ever made friends anywhere. And when people saw I can draw, they were like, oh wow, he must be a cool person. So it was pretty much how I felt like I fit into the world. So you have, you have artists in your family? Yes. You have, artist, you have artist, artistry in your DNA? Yeah. My aunts, they can draw. My grandfathers, both of them can draw. I've always been around. That's always been the main thing with me. It seems that you had one person constantly on your team. Who's that? My mother. My mother. She, she's always been with me through thick and thin. She understands me. She's always supported me. His mom allowed him to flourish, to express and discover himself with his drawings. 
she was never like, oh, you better do this, you better do that. Um, she was always like, you have a choice. You always have a choice. Kenley has a most remarkable ability. He can draw with either hand, with equal dexterity, on a double wide easel. How does that work? How does that work that you're ambidextrous? This is, this is extraordinary. Well, I just, I, <laughs> as simple and as direct as this will sound, I just pick up whatever I'm going to use and draw and let it come to me. Now, do you draw differently with each hand? Or are the, what's, what does the left hand give you that the right doesn't and vice versa? I would have to say the left gives me imagination without effort. Um, the right hand gives me precision without effort. Kenley has honed a skill of capturing the essence of a subject through a scrutinizing gaze, his well-practiced stare. But the stare is part of your profession. Yeah, I look at something once, I can remember it and draw it. Wow. Wow, there is so much going on here. What is going on in your head? I've got, uh, I don't I've know. got, I've got some kind of Roman type theme here. Mm -hmm. And then jump ahead to 2019. Yeah. And that's me. Yeah, that's you. It's a wow. cartoon of you. It's a cartoon of me, yes. Mm -hmm. Is this my guardian angel under here? Yup. Protects you from the stare. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> the stare scare. The stare scare. <laughs> Kenley Dillard, thank you very much. You are very welcome. Thank you. I'm Magalie Laguerre Wilkinson with my guardian angel at Kingsborough Community College for Urban U. When transgender CUNY PhD candidate Christopher Echohoff transitioned, his voice went from soprano down to a baritone, and he had to relearn to sing in that new register. Now he's using his own experience to help other trans singers with this very complex part of their own transition. Donna Hanover has that story. For all these years, I faced the world alone. As a professional singer and vocal coach, Christopher Echelhoff brings something extra to the table. He is transgender, and he knows how complicated transitioning is for someone who loves to sing. For people like me who are assigned female at birth and take testosterone, our vocal folds change, they'll thicken, which causes a voice drop. And with that comes through lots of cracking, like losing your ability to project. So the first year I did not take hormones because I was scared of what was gonna happen to my voice. So I lived as male and just sang as a soprano. In 2016, Chris did go on hormones and had his breasts removed. He says he had to grieve the loss of his soprano voice, but with rest, then lots of patient practice. Ave Maria. Yeah, I'm singing baritone range right now and I love it. It feels like me. I, I loved what I had before, but I really love what I have now. Chris grew up as a girl in conservative Arkansas, heavily involved in church, but engaging in secret lesbian activity. And there was an awful hellfire and brimstone sermon after that. And then I was given the option to come back if I went to conversion therapy and fix this. With all of that misery, Chris still went to college, earning a bachelor's and two master's degrees in music. Chris sang professionally, including opera with a company in Germany, and then came the chance to study music at the City University of New York. Getting accepted at the CUNY Grad Center was one of the best things to happen. I'd always wanted to move to New York City. Chris also met some transgender people in New York, which opened a new world. I always had a feeling of being male, but I didn't have words to put to that. When I moved here, I realized I actually was trans, so I went away. During the first year of my PhD here, I went away on spring break as Christina and came back as Christopher. <laughs> um, and the music department was incredibly supportive and they did everything they could to make sure I was welcomed and felt safe. Chris is also grateful to Metropolitan Community Church, a welcoming place for LGBTQ people. Chris had sung there as a soprano. And after his surgery, it was the first place he performed. Chris started teaching voice to other trans people to help cope with his own transition. How does he help transmasculine singers like himself? 
I'll have them sing where they can establish an open throat, and that comes by your larynx dropping. And if you feel right here um, on yourself, if you yawn, you feel it drop. That's kind of what we're aiming for, like when you inhale for that to drop, because it opens up so much space. So instead of sounding like, ah, uh, oh. Chris gets calls to his trans voice studio now from singers all around the world. Make sure your jaw isn't moving. Okay. Yeah. Keep it all in the same position. Yeah. One student is a trans feminine friend, Moshe Moses, a fashion designer who transitioned decades ago. I think some of my favorite moments on the teaching side is when my students have a breakthrough. Um, Moshe was singing and she hit like a soprano high C and I was just so thrilled because she never thought that was an option. What's Chris like as a teacher? He is marvelous. He is a healer. He is a maestro to me and grand and perfect in honoring who you are. Rafaela Anschel transitioned later in life and wanted what many trans feminine students desire. Where do you feel like your voice is going? Higher. He's helping me get there. Is it helpful that he is trans? Absolutely. Why? Because he has the empathy. He has deep empathy. At home, Chris has a male partner and feels blessed with the love he's gotten along the way from his mom. When I told my mother that I was seeing a man now, she said, so I had a lesbian daughter and now I have a gay son. And I said, yes. And she says, okay, <laughs> it, it was simple as that. Good on mom. She's pretty wonderful. As for recent performances, they had it Chris enjoys singing with the Trans Voices Cabaret started about three years ago. It's just really wonderful to be around other trans singers and performing because all the performers are really good. Most of them are auditioning for Broadway with Trans Voices Cabaret. It's just a way to show other people what's possible. And this was the moment, the greatest. It's not a destiny, it's as a singer, if you come out as trans, you can still sing. I'm Donna Hanover for Urban U. At the very heart of the City University of New York are dedicated professionals who month after month, year after year, keep this educational giant working. For our Urban U feature, who runs it, we honor them. This month, we highlight a dean who says her job allows her to fulfill her ultimate goal, and that is to help students thrive. Experiencing engineering as a woman, in particular as an African-American woman, has been unique in many ways. In our particular society, there's an element of marginalization. But the way I've used it is to overcome what could be challenges and turn them into opportunities. I serve as Dean of the Grove School of Engineering at the City College of New York. And with this role at CCNY, Dr. Gilda Barabino is the first African-American woman to serve as a Dean of an engineering school at a non-historical black college or university. My biggest accomplishment is reaching in touch of students. And that's part of the drive that I have in being here at a place where you can help others with opportunities. She was born in Anchorage, Alaska to a stay-at-home mother and a father in the military. She and her family moved around quite a bit, so she learned early on how to adapt to new environments and appreciate different cultures. I also learned early on in some of my formative years that everything was not equitable that everyone didn't have the same opportunities for education. So as I went through my studies, it was very important for me to not only look for different opportunities for myself, but for others. As a college student, she nixed her plans to become a clinician when she learned how chemical engineers use chemistry and fluid mechanics to solve medical problems. Her goal was to take on issues plaguing the black community, for her thesis, she focused on the abnormal blood flow in sickle cell disease. Chemical engineers often were doing a lot of work with petroleum and looking at how do you move oil from the ground move and transport oil in pipes. So think about this. So instead of the fluid being oil, the fluid's blood. And instead of having a traditional pipe, it's a blood vessel. And I use those principles to start to understand 
what were some of the abnormalities in sickle cell disease. This year, 2019, marks the 100th anniversary of engineering at the City College of New York. That's an important achievement. Her road to this 100-year-old school hasn't been easy, but she managed to conquer many challenges along the way. Most recently, she became one of only six African-American women to be elected to the National Academy of Engineering, the highest honor in the profession. I think engineering is a very special discipline in general because engineers use tools to solve complex problems and societal problems in particular. But what's so special about engineering here at the Grove School of Engineering is our people. The strength of the students and the faculty that we attract. Their determination towards getting an education. That, I think, is the biggest strength at the Grove School of Engineering. Abby Ashola for Urban U. That's our show for this month. We hope you enjoyed it. For more information on any of these stories, you can go to our website at tv.cuny.edu or check out our Urban U social media. We'll see you next time. Bye.